Hi everyone, thanks for joining. This is Seeking Sustainability in Japan. And today, once again, we're talking about one of the most popular topics about remodeling and reusing, restoring old abandoned houses, Akia in Japan. And today we have Jaya Thursfeld with us, who is Tokyo Lama for many of you who know him on YouTube, his amazing YouTube channel showing his remodel over the last few years. Thank you so much for joining, Jaya. Ah,、uh, thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. I've been a fan of your channel for a long time. There's a lot of similarities in your situation and us remodeling our house、uh, 13 years ago as well. I'd love to know a little bit of your background first before we start. So, you grew up in Melbourne, Australia, is that right? That's right. I was born and raised in Melbourne, Australia.、Um, my father's English, my mother's Indonesian. And、um, yeah, I spent、uh, my whole childhood up until, you know, early 20s in Melbourne. Yeah. And you also lived in the UK and traveled around a bit, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So I ended up leaving Melbourne、um, to work、uh, and moved to Canberra、um, for a bit, for a few years. And then after Canberra,、um, came to Japan on a working holiday. And I ended up being here for two years, and that's where I met my wife.、Um, but、um, I, I didn't want to stay at that time for、uh, long term. I, was, I wanted to sort of go off and resume a career. So I went, we decided, and I wasn't ready to go back to Australia, so、um, we decided to move to the UK.、Um, having the English、um, father, I had、um, British nationality, so it was、uh, easy enough. So we ended up moving there. And lived there for about 10 years. And then、um, my wife wanted to not necessarily come back to Japan. We always wanted to be closer to our, both our parents, in, her, her mother in、uh, Japan and、um, my parents in Melbourne.、Um, and although、um, Japan is not exactly close to Melbourne, it's a lot easier to get to、um, Australia or Melbourne from、uh, Japan than it is to from the UK. You know, it's,、yeah. a, it's a one or two hour time difference depending on time of the year. So it's a, a pretty easy flight straight down.、Um, uh, and you can get cheap flights too if you go off peak as well. Yeah,、so、we've, we've, we've had a few people from Melbourne, Australia on the show who have、right. strong connections with Japan.、Uh, Tina McCarthy, who brings cyclists over to do cycling tours in Japan. A Japanese chef、uh, who's teaching Japanese food cooking in Melbourne,、um, sake shop and sake sommeliers who live in Melbourne, who you know, have so many great connections to Japan. So it's so fun to have another Melbourne Australia、uh, yeah. representing. <laughs> yeah, I think,、um, I think there's a bit of an affinity between Melbourne and.、Uh, And Japan.、Um, even my high school, which is how I first became interested in,、uh, in Japan,、um, we had an exchange program.、Uh, and I managed to come here,、um, fortunately, for a few weeks、um, during high school、uh, with the rest of my class.、Uh, and yeah, that got me interested. In, and that's why I ended up deciding just after I'd worked a few years and decided I wanted to travel a bit to my, make my first stop,、uh, Japan. Um, for the working holiday. That's awesome.、Um, so, we're going to talk about your great house and all your amazing remodel that you've done.、Um, you seem to have a great insight into what things to reuse and restore as well. There's so many connections to sustainability.、Um, let's talk a little bit about how you chose the house. You said you bought it at auction. Is that right? That's right. We bought it in a,、uh, I guess,、um, call by public auction.、Um, so it was being sold by,、um, I think,、uh, an office related to the、uh, Ibaraki Prefecture Tax Office. So I, 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 I'd assume that the house had fallen behind on、um, or had outstanding tax debts. And Um, yeah, so that's how we came across it. But we were looking、uh, in this area. So, where, where we live now is where my wife grew up. And、um, uh, we were living in my mother in law's house, the house that my wife grew up in. And kids had already started going to the local primary school, the, 
the, the, the primary school that my wife went to. So it was a bit weird for her being back in, uh, in her old small hometown again as an adult. Um, but so we were restricted to uh, looking in this area. We didn't want to move the boys to another school. And one of the reasons to come to Japan was to be close to the mother-in-law. So we didn't want to, as much as I would have loved to have gone into the mountains um, somewhere, which is um, probably what, you know, ideally what we could or would have done. What we were we were sort of restricted to this area. So we just concentrated our search around here. And just um, fortunately, uh, this house popped up um, in local uh, the local newsletter, I think, was advertised. Um, the auction was advertised. So, yeah, we uh, sort of a bit of a nervous process uh, winning the house in the bid. But, yeah, we kind of had our hearts set on it. And it was sort of ideal. It ticked all, pretty much all of our boxes. So we we're well, a bit lucky. It looked like you you got a amazing property. Now it's not it's not only the house. You also have the surrounding land. And I've been watching your videos, so it looks like you've spent a lot of time clearing a be beautiful big yard uh, where your kids can play. So the aim you were saying is to have a comfortable place to live but also have somewhere really impressive that, you know, like you retaining certain key features that you're interested in. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I think one of the main, the, the main objective, probably more than the house was to get a large block of land. Uh, I, I really wanted a, a, a place for the kids to play outside easily um, rather than have to go over to, the park, which is quite small in this town or, you know, quite a distance and um, for a bigger park that the kids wouldn't be able to go to by themselves um, by bicycle. So that was the main aim. And then I was also interested in uh, the Minka farmhouse style house too. So ideally we would find a, a big block of land with a nice house on it that we could renovate. And uh, yeah. Um, we, I hadn't, we hadn't really at that stage thought about what we would do with the house. Um, but you know, once we got the house, I guess, I think like probably most people, then they see what the house, um, the condition of the house is like, you know, what the features of the house are and what they want to retain and restore and what they want to Im improve or, or renovate. Yeah. It's it's just it's so amazing what you've done. Uh, you said you've done some of the work yourself, like the plastering of the walls, but you've also hired professionals. Is that right? That's right. Uh, the uh, initial work and most of the structural work, or pretty much all of the structural work, was done by a father and son carpenter team that we were recommended, actually by the uh, original builder of the house. The original carpenter who built this built this house um, actually lives down the road, and we're fortunate enough to be able to meet up with him. And I'm still in touch with him. Um, I've, I'm, I've been out uh, visiting and filming one of the temples that he's building there. He's a he's a Miyadaiku. He's a temple builder. And initially, we had contracted or we got a quote from him to do the house, and. Unfortunately, he kind of works by himself. He no longer has a, a partner to help him, and he just didn't think he'd be able to do the work by himself. I think if I had known what I do now, I probably would have volunteered to, you know, be committed and helping him as an assistant. If he, if that's what he, he would have been happy with, he might not have been. But he's a very friendly guy, and we um, get along well. Um, but so, in, in what he did instead was he recommended a, a couple of other carpenters. Um, that would be able to uh, do the renovations that he had uh, quoted on already. And uh, uh, so we're lucky there. And that was another carpenter his age. So he's, he's in, the, in his mid-70s, still working. And so we had the other carpenter who's in his mid-70s and his son, so I guess was, would have been um, maybe 50 or so. And they, uh, yeah, they came and they did most of the initial work, uh, putting up walls, strengthening posts, uh, and, and so on. And, you know, doing the ceilings for us and, and so on. So a lot of, a lot of stuff they did. 
Yeah, let's let's talk about the ceilings. Um, I and you mentioned a temple carpenter. I've interviewed temple carpenters in the series as well. And for example, John Stolenmeyer, who builds beautiful Japanese houses, um, and he told me a lot about the original beams. And I see this in your house as well as as our house, which I I'm so proud of now. Um, that like tree like shape, the natural tree bumpiness is so rare and so difficult to find now in Japan. And I see this in your beams and how you've exposed the ceiling beams. So you have that beautiful, unique wow, tree shape of the beams all throughout the ceiling. That's just gorgeous. Yeah, that was something we really wanted to do. And um, it wasn't initially so we got a lot of quotes from different places so um we got some from big uh japanese construction renovation companies as well as a smaller um boutique kuminka specialist uh companies too and as well as the the carpenters um who we ultimately went with and to the big companies in particular to keep the budget low as they're quite expensive uh didn't want to uh, expose the beams. They wanted to retain, um, replace the existing kitchen ceiling, um, which was in pretty bad condition, and because uh, that it would have just added to the budget. And I think that's why with the, the getting the smaller carpenters was much cheaper, and allowed us to do a lot more things. And also, they were willing to let me uh, do some work too uh, to try and reduce the budget and uh, yeah. and so on. Whereas the big companies, they were not. Uh, uh, are going to approve that at all because they have part of their cost is with warranties and so on. So once someone else that is not uh, employed by them starts working on, then, you know, it's hard to um, maintain any warranties and guarantees for the house. So I can understand that, but uh, definitely going with the the small carpenter who is flexible uh, opened up a lot more things we were able to do, like expose the beams and so once that was done, yeah, we were able to go up and clean them ourselves and paint them ourselves or stain them ourselves, and um, which reduced a lot of the costs too. That's awesome. We found that as well. If you uh, really want a unique look, you want to retain certain things, you really have to shop around for the right people to yeah. work with because a lot of the bigger companies, they just want to do what I guess the average customer wants, which is very Western style. Yeah. And what, what you were doing and what we were trying to do is retain some of the traditional aesthetic, but add it uh, in a comfortable way, right? Yeah, that's right. Try and get that balance. Because, I mean, yeah, a, a lot of what we've done is is towards the Western style, especially the, the kitchen. Um, but yeah, you're right. The big companies tend to want to make the house look like a new house almost inside they they do do more traditional um looks and you can see in their brochures and some houses look amazing what they've done but we found when we visited a lot of those um, model renovations you have to pay a lot of money for them to do the more customized uh traditional look you know with the all of the things that you want like insulation and things like that whereas they can do the more simple uh standard you know, new house look for a lot lower budget. But those those ones they have in their brochures that look amazing are pretty uh, much worth, worth, worth way out of our budget. Yeah. So I, I've heard this from Asby Brown as well, who's written some books about uh, building design in Japan and Japanese carpentry. And he, he also suggests if you are doing remodeling work, shop around because yeah. a lot of the designers, they actually won't cost as much as the big companies and they'll make it look really beautiful and unique. And you're supporting the local craftspeople as well, right? Yeah, I think that's the, the best way to do it. Um, we were a bit lucky in that uh, our family friend who's quite a, an established um, architect um, in Tokyo um, did the uh, design work for us uh, and drew up all of the, the blueprints and at a pretty um, good rate. I mean, uh, yeah, he, he, he gave us a, a mates rate on that. Uh, which was helpful too. And I, I think ha having the architect, I, if you can afford it and if it's necessary, I mean, if you do a simple renovation, it's probably not necessary. But if you, you can 
afford an architect, I'd recommend that just because they um, have familiarity with the the structures of the house. They can also talk to the carpenters uh, from a position of more knowledge rather than me, you know, researching and trying to explain to the carpenter what I think he should be doing, whereas, you know, which which could be, you know, not make sense, whereas I can, some of the things I can talk with the architect and uh, ask him, run things by him, and he can, um, or I can then speak to the carpenters about what we would like to do, and um, I found that really helpful. And also the architect, especially if it's a local architect, will know costs and prices um, in the area, so um, he can help you with, you know, giving you an idea of what sort of quotes you're receiving are are fair and um, realistic. And also our architect um, knew a good kitchen uh, maker. And so we were able to combine the cheaper arch the carpenters with a, um, a kitchen maker. A cu custom kitchen in Japan is really expensive. So uh, we were able to do a kind of hybrid model where we got most of the structures done by the carpenters and then the kitchen maker came in to make the drawers and install the appliances and so on, which reduced the, um, the kitchen cost of the kitchen substantially. Yeah, amazing. I want to just give out a shout to people who are joining us live right now. Uh, thank you to Enrique Mendoza. Hi, always amazing to be here. Thank you so much. Fras says, I'm so happy I could watch this one, Jaya. You are the one that motivated me into getting and wanting to buy, build, and live in one of these Japanese houses. Thanks, you man. And I watched all your videos. Thanks, Fras. It's great to have you guys here. Awesome. Yeah, I get a few comments. Some um, people saying that they have um, sort of been motivated to to do something similar to this. And yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I, it, you know, it wasn't expected that a lot of people would watch my YouTube videos, but I'm glad that it has um, helped people to sort of um, get that extra motivation to to do it themselves. No, you've inspired so many people, and you're uh videos and you know your channel has grown so much it's been so successful it's amazing yeah wonderful to see <laughs> yeah i think i got a bit lucky early on with the uh the google the youtube algorithm and so yeah i think it's one of those things it's hard to predict <laughs> with youtube yeah oh, we have on facebook we've got wendy bigler who's also remodeling a an old house in nagano Oh, and, nice. uh, I'm, I'm very jealous of uh, hearing about uh, renovations in Nagano because, yeah, I think, as I mentioned earlier, um, ideally I would be living in the mountains. And I, I, actually, I visited a, um, an Australian guy recently and I filmed his renovation of a uh, kominka in Nagano, and it was absolutely stunning up there. Uh, oh, I, I haven't edited have that video. That. I haven't that seen soon. that one yet. Yeah. Yeah, I actually did it a while back, and I just haven't had a chance to properly edit it. Um, but it's quite interesting what he's done. Uh, he's, he's yeah, sort of, awesome. Um, well, one one thing that I wanted to point out is you have visited Laura and Ichi, who are also in Ibaraki. Uh, you went That's out right. and, and interviewed them at their remodel. Uh, and they have, Laura has also been in the talk show last year talking about what they're doing. Now, it's really interesting, and it must be interesting for you as well, to compare and contrast someone in the same prefecture, but doing remodeling, of course, um, as well, but in a very different way with a focus on high quality things, but keeping it as budget as possible, right? Yeah, definitely. They're, they're definitely they've definitely been more focused on uh, maintaining a low budget than we have. <laughs> and that's great because I, I do think, um, and I think I mentioned this in one of my videos, if I had any regrets about the place, and I don't really, but I do think uh, we missed maybe an opportunity to go really low budget and not uh, get a mortgage. So we got a mortgage to, uh, to, to do the full renovation. And... I do see stories of people, you know, getting a house like this and not uh, going into debt, uh, and think, yeah, that that's nice. I see the, I see the, definitely see the, uh, the positive side of that. But at the same time, I'm glad uh, we've done what we've done as well. So 
Um, we haven't we haven't gone crazy, but um, yeah. Uh, at the same yeah. time, it's fun to well, see let's, uh, Laura let's and Ichi. Let's talk about pricing for a minute because it's really interesting how uh, Laura and Ichi are trying to stay under ten million for a house and remodel. Right? Mm. Um, you actually got your place for three million at the auction, so maybe you can get a lot better deal if you go to the auctions, even though it's a bit more hassle. Have you found that? Actually, I haven't found that so much. Um, I found with the auctions, and this is uh, re reflected in our house, that they tend to start the minimum bids on these houses at quite a high price, above what I would deem to be a market price. I mean, even my place, I think, was above market price. Because what the, the, the process of the auctions, um, or at least in our case, and I think that's quite common in Japan, is to do blind bid auctions with a minimum uh selling price and so they don't for example start the bid really start the the bidding really low you know at you know zero or uh, you know a couple of hundred thousand so they, they set it at quite a high price and then you only get one bid and it's sealed uh so and you don't know who else is bidding if anyone and of course you don't know what other people are going to bid so it's a bit nerve-wracking like that. Uh, so for our house, the first time we saw it, actually, the place was listed with a minimum selling price of 5.5 uh, 5 million yen. And at this point, my heart was set on it, but um, my wife uh, <laughs> said, no, we're not going to pay that much uh, smartly <laughs> because uh, and and so what we did, we just monitored it and uh, as as expected, uh, no one bid on it. It was just too much um, considering the work required even, to clear even it. Even five million is such a bargain. Like I in Onomichi, which is kind of a an outside Hiroshima city area, uh, be a beautiful home uh, of a friend from Melbourne, Australia, 9 million and in really good condition. But, you know, the 5 million for something you can move into without too much trouble, even that is not bad. And you got it for 3 million for house and land. That's amazing. But uh, if, yeah, if you look at how much rubbish was on the land, oh, yes. I think that oh, yes. would put a lot of let's, people off. Let's talk about the rubbish in a yeah. minute because that's an <laughs> insane amount of rubbish. Um, we have a question from Woven Squash. Thanks for joining from YouTube. Uh, do you know the difference about renovating in the mountains dealing with snow and winter? Now, I noticed, Jaya, you have installed a beautiful uh, fireplace. Has that yeah. really helped uh, keep warm in winter? Yeah, definitely, because we don't have really any other heating at this stage. We haven't got around to putting in air conditioners or, um, you know, air conditioners slash heaters, and we don't have central heating. Um, yeah, we are in a different situation to the mountains. So it gets cold here, but it doesn't snow, really. You might get a once or twice a year a light dusting of snow that doesn't really settle on the ground. And... Even now, it seems to be really cold. Like overnight, might be minus four, um, but in the mornings it's it's zero, and during the day you get up to ten, fifteen degrees. So it's not too bad. It is cold though. Um, I would I've, say I've seen a lot of people in the countryside uh, who have invested in these high quality wood stoves. Um, what, which brand or which style did you end up choosing? And did you build the, the stone behind it to make the place for the fireplace? Uh, yeah, so we ended up getting a, um, it's a British company called Hunter. And it's a, um, a Hunter Ingle Nook high output stove, uh, which we bought from a, a local uh, re uh, retailer. And it's quite expensive. In, in It's much more expensive than um, in the UK, I think. Um, it, the stove is expensive, but the actual flue is really expensive too. And we've got a really uh, high flue. It's over seven meters. So um, that was quite expensive. And, yeah, the stone we got uh, is Oyaishi, and that was done by a, a, a local uh, craftsman. 
Um, I didn't do that myself. Um, but so that was a, the idea was and the design was by the architect. That was his yeah. um, idea. And we're really happy with that. But um, just to go back to the mountains uh, difference. So I don't know. And I, I, I went up to this Australian guy in Nagano and um, I think he's, he had exactly the same stove as I did uh, by coincidence. And uh, we, I compared prices. We played, paid the same price. So I was like relieved to know that I wasn't getting <laughs> completely ripped off on the stove. But um, I think the, the coldest, we've insulated our house and done a pretty good job. But the parts that we haven't done, and I think what I'd like to do eventually, is that these big windows here are all single pane. The the houses moved slightly, it shifted with the wood over the years and earthquakes, I guess, and settled in this position now. So there are gaps um, in some of the uh, some of the um, frames between the windows. So you you get cold air coming through the gaps, coming through the window. We have shoji, which actually does a pretty good job of retaining the heat. I don't know. Do you have your full shoji? Um, yeah, with paper? Uh, we, I know. we don't have the engawa though, and oh, okay. you have you have like a inside outside hallway called the engawa mm. in Japan, right? And then the yeah. shoji and the doors have a gap, so that helps insulate as well. Kind of traditional style, right? Yeah, although the engawa is freezing <laughs> at night, yeah. so it's almost the same. I think it's maybe maybe one degree or two degrees. Yeah, but changing the windows for us that was a game changer. Yeah. Um, upstairs in our house, we had these crazy lower windows in the bottom of every wall where you could open and I guess sweep dust out in the old days. But yeah. we had to get rid of those because it was just so freezing in winter, the wind rustling through. Um, but having an extra layer of window put in front was a cheaper version. And then for some of the bigger windows, we paid for the, the double pane. And that, yeah. that made a big difference, yeah. Yeah, all our new windows are double pane. But I, if I was getting a place like this in the mountains um, with you know, con constant snow and sub-zero temperatures, I would invest in getting all of the windows replaced. And it won't be cheap to get all those Ingawa windows done. Um, I sort of got an kind of an idea i did look into it. it's kind of it would be probably i don't know um the prices can vary and maybe if you imported some but it, i don't know getting sizes but you're looking over a million yen easily i think to replace all those and then the work required i mean maybe i could do that myself now with a bit of knowledge but if you were to hire a carpenter to put those in and, and redo the frames that would add up as well but i think if you're doing a, a place in a cold area you would definitely need to get double, triple uh, glazed windows for sure, I think, um, yeah. as, in addition but to the regular putting insulation. Uh, insulation. In is, is also a big cost, but you're saving money on energy energy yeah. costs. Right? So it's an investment in, in energy savings and yeah. uh, aesthetics, probably a, a little bit more stable. You're supporting the frame a bit better when you get better windows in, right? Yeah, and I think anyway, you wouldn't be able to heat the house fast enough to stop the cold coming in if you didn't insulate. So you would, it's just, it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, re insulating, I think, and it would right. be a necessity. And in a cold climate, you'd have to make sure you do all the windows, seal all of the air gaps. Because especially if you're running a stove, it's pulling cold, cold air through the gaps in the windows. And so we have yeah. the shoji, which does a pretty good job, although the shoji is not exactly free of gaps between the where the shoji wood um, frames meet. But it does a pretty good job. Um, yeah, we can get nice, comfortable, warm temperatures in there. We do, on the cold mornings and cold nights, we do uh, in in the other opposite end of the, of the house to the stove, we have a kerosene stove, one of the sort of more traditional, look, you know, those corona ones those yeah, you see yeah. the we have one of those going heaters, like many yeah. old houses in japan have right to heat up room to room yeah, uh, i didn't has central heating um speaking of shoji though i really love that tip from your architect that checked the house with you that if the shoji is stuck then that could indicate a structural problem i yeah. hadn't heard that before that's a great tip 
Yeah. So, um, I mean, beams do sag to a certain extent, but if you're noticing that really the Fusuma or Shoji is, is not moving at all, it, you know, we would warrant further investigation to make sure that in you know, the house itself is not sagging at all. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I find actually in summer, um, when you get all the heat and humidity, the, the wood beams expand, you can have a bit of trouble uh, opening and closing shoji. They get stuck. So we've had to pull a, f a few of them off and then, you know, sort of shave them down to, to get them in and out more easily. Uh, easily. Yeah, we, we have that as well, seasonal. But I guess if it's just really stuck. Uh, yeah, it was really stuck, stuck. That, uh, right? it's, it's a bit different. <laughs> At least it'll give you uh, a bit of a, uh, a tip to just investigate further. Yeah. We, we had uh, the second remodel company, uh, we did a second remodel after 10 years and they uh, checked all the upper floor and the beams and whether they connected and they suggested a support beam underneath. So we really appreciated that they were, you know, making sure our structure was still safe. That was nice. Yeah. Um, let's look at the outside of your structure. You found these old photos of what it looked like when it was first built. And you've really retained a lot of the traditional beauty on the outside. And you said it's only 30 years old? Yeah, so probably 30, yeah, 32 or 33 now. So I think finished, it finished, um, they finished construction in a, a 1989. I think you can see on that photo um, the date. Uh, the Maybe down in the corner? I think that's where I... Yeah, maybe I didn't capture it all on the... On the the scan. That's what the screen grab. So maybe I <laughs> yeah. that, yeah. Um, but you you have also done since you're sat in the garden right now. Can you tell us what you've done around the garden? Yeah. So um, there were quite a lot of agricultural sheds. Uh, this this um, family was in uh, rice farming originally. I think they left that. Uh, perhaps in the early 90s or so, but they still had a lot of the sheds and the equipment left over from uh, rice farming. And some of the sheds were in pretty bad condition and, you know, they would never be salvageable. So we removed those sheds. Um, the, the, the main one was that big one you can see at the back there uh, with the tiles. And I was thinking to keep that one it's still quite nice and I, I it wasn't such an easy decision to remove that um it was attached to a, a another larger uh, um galvanized iron shed too so uh that i guess took up a lot of the space that i wanted to use again for um a, a, a garden that my kids could play in and removing that yeah so that's what it looks like now and removing that also opened up the house to a lot more light so the house itself i think you find this quite it's quite common with a lot of uh farmhouses uh here that a lot of the available space is taken up with uh sheds which is understandable i mean it's uh, they serve a practical purpose and um the house is kind of enclosed by uh sheds and what we did though was i wanted to open it up uh allow more light in and also yeah, we, we have a road at the, the back there and uh, yeah, show, let people see what the house looks like as well. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so that was the reasoning behind removing those sheds. Uh, we kept the main kura though. Uh, there was no question about not keeping that as... Um, yeah, so that's... the kura, kura is like a storehouse, right? That's right, the two-story storehouse, which yeah, is a decent size in itself. Uh, but that's going to be the next step of the renovation progress. We haven't really touched that at all. Now, uh, of course, you had to clear the garden. I've already showed what it looked like before with all the weeds and everything. But the inside of the house was also just full of trash. And that was just fascinating to me because a lot of similarities. Our house also was full. Uh, but... Part of the deal was that we we had an hour to go through and, and keep anything. And then the agent had already hired someone to take the rest. Oh, really? Uh, 
but really interesting all the similarities for example you found all these old lighters yeah you do like in different containers uh you found lots of old umbrellas how did you get rid of everything it must have been such a headache because in japan you've got all the separated gomi on certain days <clears throat> Uh, you said some of the metal scraps would be taken away for free, but you had cars, washing machines, appliances. Oh my God! Yeah. Tell us about that process. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we definitely had more appliances than normal. Definitely above average, and there were some of the things that we hadn't really um, thought that much about at the time when we bought the place. So, yeah, we underestimated the amount of work it would take to to clear the house up. So, yeah, you're right. There's there's so many different um, rubbish segments in Japan, but fortunately we have a um, a sodai gomi, the um, the large uh, rubbish size kind of I guess a, a, a tip, um, a dump, um, not too far from our house, and we're la we're able to take a lot of the stuff there. They pretty much take everything, uh, so we could take a lot of the stuff there. It's just a question of piling it up into a little K truck which I rented. And um, and you know making multiple trips there, but a lot of work just going through and collecting uh, the different things. And the metal, yeah, as you mentioned, you can take metal to a metal scrapper yourself and maybe get a little bit of money um, in return. But when you have so much rubbish like we did, it was a lot easier just to get a metal scrapper to come and they'll take it away for free, um, even if it's got some other stuff. And they'll take it to their yards and then sort it there because... Um, I think if you take it to a scrap yard yourself, you pretty much need to clean it off off, off all of the the uh, other plastic and stuff. Actually, so what they did, actually, they would come and they, they would clean it off, you know, the plastic and stuff, leave that here for us to dispose of. But they would do the work for us and they'd take it away for us. So it saved a, quite a bit of hassle um, that way. Yeah. And, um, some of the bigger yeah. items we did get some money for. So we did oh, you sell. did? Okay. Because yeah. sometimes in Japan, you can get those trucks coming around, uh, which are shouting or you yeah. know, doing the announcement, we're collecting any old appliance. Did you try any of those companies that would take yeah. away old stuff? Um, yeah. So for the appliances, they didn't take, I don't think they took TVs, though, which is the, the, the difficult one. Um, or you fridges. had like 15 TVs, right? Yeah. I think a lot of I think uh, people have just been dumping some of their old TVs here because it costs money to dispose of a TV. Uh, you know, you, we ended up taking those TVs back to a courier who then takes them back to the original manufacturer, and you pay sort of between two thousand and three thousand yen per TV um, to ha get them couriered back. But if you've got ten, fifteen TVs, that that adds up. You know, <laughs> so. Um, so wow. it was an expense that you know we kind of couldn't really avoid. Similar with the um, on a small fridges. point, all of these uh, big size beer bottles and sake bottles, which you found, you said you found a lot of bottles. Um, all of those should be taken back by the the company or any sake shop because those big size bottles are reused. But I don't know when they're so old and dirty whether they would just recycle them or reuse them, right? Yeah, the problem was that they were really dirty. And um, so the recy even the recyclers didn't really want a lot of them. Um, we tried cleaning as much as we could, but some of it was just um, impossible. So unfortunately, some of that had to go into the um, the the moenagomi. There, there's even we couldn't even take it to the large um, size. They didn't want it because it was too small. Even if we ha they, we had crates of it, and they were basically just. Yeah, you're going to have to put it into the unburnable rubbish, which is uh, a bit of a shame. a shame, isn't it? Because it would yeah. be recyclable or reusable. It would be. Yeah. But uh, I think that's the problem with um, a lot of the rubbish here is they, they want pristine, clean stuff. They don't want to clean it themselves at their plants. I don't, uh, I, in the UK, they were really good. You could put everything uh, into one in, in our um, borough in London. You could put all of the paper, glass, plastic into one uh, bin and they would sort it at their plants and which made sense to me because they would do a much better job of sorting because I, I don't think you, even though the Japanese tend to try to do it properly a lot of people don't and even men make mistakes if they're trying so 
doesn't seem so efficient. I'm not sure. But. Yeah, we we had one uh, good relationship with a, a local uh, di- not secondhand shop, and they they came and we paid I think twenty thousand yen, and they filled up their truck, and then they sold some of the retro stuff at their shop. And then they recycled or reused what they could. They had a good connection with a lot of other dealers. Um, So for us, that was worth it because it would have taken us so much time to figure out where all these little things are going to go, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I got a few comments saying that I could have sold the uh, TVs, especially the old TVs, retro style TVs um, in the US for uh, a couple of thousand dollars. But um, I think at that stage, we had so much work uh, trying to organize uh, shipping in a container <laughs> to the US and going through all of that process. I, if I'd known about it, it would have been, it would have been too much uh, of a hassle anyway. It, you know, yeah. you would have lost a lot of the <laughs> profit along the way, all the costs. We've done a collaboration with Matt Ketchum of Aki and Inaka. That's right. That's and- right. And they're starting to, for areas where there's a lot of abandoned houses, they're starting to do like flea market days when they get people there and go through the houses. And I think people can take stuff they want. And ideas like that is, it's a really good way to get people to go and reuse some of this stuff that would normally just be thrown out. How many times does it break my heart and probably yours to see some of these existing houses just being torn apart and everything just being taken to the dump when it could yeah. be reused, right? A lot of the stuff, even a lot of our, um, so we, we, we've reused as much as we can. So that, that, that kerosene heater um, we use is actually one of the heaters that was left behind. But yeah, even driving down the street, we, um, a lot of our firewood comes from construction sites. So, uh, one time we passed a construction site nearby and they had um, huge, massive logs of uh, keaki and um, kashi, the sort of the, the Japanese elm and the, the Japanese oak. And um, that was just, we spoke to the foreman there and that was just scheduled to be taken to um, uh, a rubbish collection and burnt. Um, so we asked if we could have it and he was more than happy for us to take it instead. But yeah, a lot of the time is I think um, it's uh, it's easier and the first thought is to just dispose of it and take pay the costs rather than well you um, you had so much to do and uh, you know you're trying to get so much on the inside and the outside done at the same time so dealing with all the recycle shops and all the garbage uh, must just be such a nightmare. In your great video about seven interesting things that you found, um, yeah. one of the things that really struck out to me was all the traditional tools, like these mallets here. Yeah. How interesting. Yeah, so therefore, uh, I believe they're made for making uh, mochi. Uh, so, um, yeah, unfortunately, they're not in particularly good condition, so I use them for <laughs> putting in posts in the garden and things like that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, well, still use One them. thing I saw in Kamikatsu is they had a lot of these old traditional tools from abandoned houses, and the brewery has used it as decoration on the walls. So mm. they have, like, these old traditional saws or mallets as kind of wall decor, and I thought that was really cool. That's a, that's a nice idea. Yeah, maybe I could restore a couple of the mallets and um, use them as some kind of decoration. Yeah. I've seen, um, I think in that same video, there's a, I, I show the, it's been a long time, but I, I yeah, that's right. I, did. I showed the, that winnower, which I called a thresher, but apparently I was, um, some commenters say it's actually a winnower. Um, and I've seen another video um, on YouTube by, um, of a Kyoto house on the YouTube channel, Life Where I'm From. Greg, I think it is, and um, someone's using one of those as a uh, has has as, as using one of those as decoration in their house. It's um been done up nicely, um, so I'm not sure if I have the space to put it in anywhere, but I'm, de- I'm I've held on to that, and that'd be nice. See that I do it up when I have the time. Some it's diamond. it's a beautiful old machine, yeah. and yeah. it is so cool in the video how you're showing how it was used to take the outside of the rice off to to create you know the thresher is it or yeah and, uh, apparently it's a winnower 
Oh, um, when you were. Okay. So it 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 removes the chaff. Yeah. Before the threshing process, I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's uh, beautiful. Uh, uh, we nice had stomach. some uh, foot, foot motor, uh, old style sewing machines, and yep. we we passed them on to antique shops. But we kind of wish we had kept that. You know, like really cool to have around. But when you've got so much stuff, oh man, it's so hard to to think about how to use it, right? <laughs> yeah, and a lot of the things you don't want to like that you don't want to throw away. Um, and I, I'm. I, I would consider giving it away to someone at some point, um, but I'd like to just hold on just um, in case that I do find the, uh, the time at some point to restore it myself and then to see if we've got any way to, to put it. Uh, maybe at that time we've uh, renovated the Kura, uh, Kura and we can put it in the Kura or something like that as decoration there. So, yeah, that's uh, awesome. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the garden. So you have uh, <coughs> cleared... I, I noticed you were using a chipper. So for a lot of yep. the old branches, you were using a chipper. So then you can use that as mulch in the garden. Uh, you put yep. down grass as well. You've, yep. you've done a lot in the garden and it really totally changed that space. So your kids can go and play, uh, grow some food. So many great ideas. Can you talk about your garden a little bit? Yeah, so the garden was really important to me. As you mentioned, uh, I wanted a space to um, for the kids to play, a lawn. Uh, the, the boys, um, even from when they're in the UK, are really into soccer. And, I, and growing up in Australia, uh, I had a pretty big backyard as well where, you know, we could play cricket and uh, um, football, Australian football. And so I, I wanted the same thing for my kids as well, and I wanted it to be easy, especially now when, you know, you – uh they're competing with uh, things like soccer competing with games and youtube and things like that so i wanted it to be easy for them to just go outside and play and you know play with their friends too so that's the reasoning behind having the lawn um and yeah that's been great um they've been you know they especially in the holidays now they've got even in winter they can go out and play and then you know, come back into the <laughs> the warm house. Um, Sounds like and, they're going out to play right now, right? Uh, yeah, I, I, I mentioned earlier, one, one boy. They're probably dying to come out. It looks like loud. nice weather. No, I don't think they are right now. It's still a bit chilly, actually. Okay. <laughs> so, and but I did say like after really... this I'd play football with them, so um, maybe uh, they are getting a bit hyped. But, um, yeah. yeah, so that you was the main reason. Built, yeah. built a compost uh, Yeah, area. built a compost, yeah build a compost there um and that's been really good because yeah the the raw food gets collected um but that can pile up really quickly and we hardly have any it's obviously it's mainly just leftovers from non-compostable you know foods like you know meats and stuff like that we can put into the raw food collection and that's almost empty you know? yeah and so it's been good to be able to put all the um the vegetable scraps in there and also, you know, um, yeah, just from the garden as well, everything in there leaves, as well, and leaves and, and yeah, and leaves. I, I we use I lose a lot of the leaves for for uh, mulch as well. Uh -huh. uh, they the the um, the flower beds are under the, a lot of them are under quite some some quite big trees. Yeah, there, and so you get a lot of the leaves falling there, and I, I kind of um, blow a lot of the leaves into there as well. And, uh, after we do the weeding stuff. So, yeah, I, I've always enjoyed gardening too. So uh, I wanted to have a, a, a kind of garden, like a um, a border garden. Uh, so that's sort of yeah. what I'm and it was so it was so nice to see that you put the – to make a hedge to block your, your bathroom area, you chose kinmukse, which is an yep. orange blossom. And yeah. I love this. And we have this at our house, a gift from our previous owners. And I've actually seen kinmukse jam. I love uh, the yeah. smell of it as well. It's such a yeah. gorgeous Japanese plant, right? Yeah. Yeah, I wanted something a bit more interesting than just a normal – um hedge there uh, you know so you know with i really like the i didn't know much about them until i started researching what you know 
hedges were available in Japan. So I came across the Kinmokuse and I thought that would be ideal, you know, with the, the nice uh, orange flowers and the fragrance as well. So hopefully they grow. And you've also grow. planted a red momiji and a sakura was given to you from your friends. So you're going to have so many beautiful colors at different seasons, right? Yeah, that's the idea. I've been trying to make sure we've got some part of the garden flowering at every time of year. So uh, over winter, we have the, um, the camellia, um, the, yeah, uh, tsubaki uh, blooming, have the white and the, uh, the pink ones there. And then, yeah, early, um, late spring, sorry, late winter, early, um, uh, early spring. I think I've, I've put in a few daffodils and uh, uh, snowdrops and things like that. So we'll see if they, hopefully they bloom next year. And then you've got the, uh, yeah, then you've got the, the plum as well I've planted. So that should then take us into the sakura and the nanohana, which is um, uh, spring, quite, uh, yeah, yeah. A quite an abundant plant in this area. There is a beautiful garden near me that has sakura blooming right now. And people call oh, really? it winter sakura. So ah. there's so many different kinds of cherry yeah. trees. Yeah, I have seen that. I was wondering, I saw a, like somewhere in the neighborhood, someone had a kind of plum sakura looking uh, tree blooming and I was wondering what's what's going on there. So maybe I need to look into that too. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the inside of the house. So yep. did you replace all the tatami and all the shoji doors? I look like some of the areas, maybe the the toilet, the wooden paneling was already there. You just upgraded the toilet itself. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So that um, just on that toilet. So that's the there was only one toilet. It's the original toilet. So yeah, um, pretty much just replaced the toilet itself um, and added. Uh, we expanded it slightly, made it a little bit longer, and then fit in uh, a, a slightly larger basin. So yeah, I did that, and then um, the kitchen uh, was a big change, right? Kitchen was the big change, yeah. We wanted definitely wanted a more Western style, a larger um, kitchen. So, um, yeah, sorry about the kids. They're really quite noisy right now. So, yeah, we ended up um, combining two rooms um, there uh, to make the kitchen and to um, build that island. Uh, and we wanted to sort of have that some more open so that we could open up and um, have the kitchen and the living area sort of combined. Um, the the tatami is uh, all new tatami. So the old tatami wasn't in terrible condition, but uh, it's one of those things my wife said, we're really keen to get new tatami. We're going um, to we'll move in. And we thought about perhaps trying to get it uh, recycled. Um, but, yeah, we, I think we um, just wanted... Uh, to get the new the new tatami and just sort of make a fresh start there. Um, the yeah. shoji is all original. We just repapered, uh -huh. cleaned and repapered. Wow. So the fusuma frames are also original um, and just uh, repapered the, uh, the fusuma too. That's beautiful. Yeah, we, we had a professional plasterer, Kyle, uh, talk about using old tatami in the walls when they redo uh. the, the walls. Um, but it's a really tedious process. So, yeah, uh, maybe you could compost it. I don't know about old tatami. But yeah, it's so we dry. have put it into the flower beds as a kind of, um, yeah, we looked again at perhaps um, because we thought maybe the, the wooden frames, the, you know, maybe it could get recycled. But I guess tatami are custom made for pretty much before the room. So we asked a sort of local tatami um, shop and they were not, particularly interested in <laughs> in taking it so you have to kind of either take it to the um to the sodai gomi the large um size um, rubbish tip uh we just put it into our um beds the only problem there is there is a little bit of nylon there so once it breaks down then you got to go back and try and pull all of the uh, the nylon out i think on the more modern tatami has the nylon i'm not sure about older style tatami yeah. i guess so it doesn't <laughs> So yeah. the big question, we've got about five more minutes, is from now, what do you want to do? So you've been doing all this great remodeling work for about three years. Is that right? How? how yeah, probably about two years. That? So, yeah, um, just over two years. Yeah. 
in the um, future? Do you have a lot more projects or you feel like you've done all the basic things? Now it's just fine, fine tuning. Yeah, there, there are some big projects. I mean, there's that Kura, which is a huge project in itself. And to do that, I'd like to do that properly um, at some point, but there's, you know, a question of time and money on that. So, but it needs work sooner, probably rather than later in some parts, like the, um, the, the veranda roof. Um, need, we need to try and fix that up. So I might just do that first and then do the rest of the Kura at another date because the rest of it's still in really good condition. We got the, um, the main roof of the Kura fixed when we first moved in. Um, and, uh, that was leaking. And fortunately, all the beams and the inside wood are still in great condition. So that's, that's no problem now. Um, and in, in the house, uh, yeah, it's just sort of quite a lot of little things we need to do. Um, the first floor, I've done some of the work since my last video. So I sort of outlined um, some of the things that needed to be done in my most recent video earlier this month. And I've done a couple of the things in there now. <laughs> I haven't done a huge amount, just been a bit busy with Christmas and everything. But I'm um, not making excuses. But uh, uh, after that, the first floor should be pretty much finished soon. And then ideally I'd like to work, work on the second floor at some point. Um, try and make use of that space more. Well, you've then, done uh, a beautiful loft. Was that your idea to have a, a space for your kids to hang out? It's such a gorgeous reuse of exposed beams and making a little loft area there. A gorgeous idea. Was that your original idea? No, that was our arch architect's idea. Again, so uh, yeah, one of the advantages of having the architect, I don't think I would have considered that. But so the... Um, we wanted, you know, a pantry and uh, an extra toilet and the architect, obviously the pantry needs to be close to the kitchen and the architect insisted that the uh, the toilet also be close to the living areas too. So we were going to put that further back towards, originally my idea was to put the toilet back near the bathroom in the sort of bathhouse area. But the architect suggested that it's, it's better to have the toilet closer to the living areas. Um, yeah. And then if we're going to do that, to make that section and then you and then have a loft to to get a bit of extra space. And it's not really, yeah, it is really nice. It's a nice little nook that I, kids can go to to um, have a bit of chill out time. And I actually, it's more for me and my wife to go up there to chill out. Um, yeah, it's beautiful, you know, gorgeous. Like that. Yeah. Um, just, we have just a few more minutes. Can you show us around your garden right now and see the outside of the house maybe? All right. Uh, I'll just underside of your roof is just gorgeous yeah it's, it's the detail it's, it's i think it's a bit more detailed than most other houses like this so yeah i, I spend a bit of time sanding that and cleaning that and then staining it and so and the okay, so, tiles are gorgeous is that original tile they're all the original tiles yeah so amazing um let's go here yeah, so we did have, some of the roof we did need to fix up, but most of the roof was in good condition and the, all original tiles. And so, yeah, the garden and socket net's a bit worse for where I've got a new one I need to put on. But, um, yeah, so. Um, and you've got your fruit trees and your little uh, garden over there. Are you growing any vegetables? So, yeah, that's the, uh, where am I? Okay, yeah, we have, that's sort of a temporary little place for um, vegetables. I do have another area um, marked out for, we're going to put in raised beds, but um, that requires a bit of work. Um, so the, just for the time being, this year we're going to make it into a patio, but we've been growing like eggplant, beans, chilies, uh, cherry tomatoes, things like that in there. Uh, sorry. That's awesome. Yeah, winter time it's hard to grow things. Yeah. And you've got that big yard so your kids can play soccer. That's awesome. Yep. That's right. So that's uh, that's I sort of made some goal posts there. And um And just behind the soccer is that the compost area? That's the compost over there, yeah. Over there in that corner. And so, that's been working okay. The compost Yeah, it's probably not the best needed? position to be honest. Um doesn't quite get enough sun especially during a uh, summer mm -hmm. but um I, I didn't want it's sort of it's hard to find another place because i didn't want to put it for example the other side which gets more sun too close to my neighbors um so. i didn't ask you why did you choose the name tokyo llama 
Um, yeah, the uh, reason was I, I wanted a, I was looking for a, um, a kind of name for the, uh, the channel and I wanted a, a sort of a place and I wanted an animal and I sort of like, I don't know, I, I thought maybe that would be a nice sort of uh, catchy title as well as making a, a nice interesting logo that would match it. So I spent a bit of time in South America and I liked llamas and uh, alpacas and vicuñas and all sorts of those things. And uh, so I thought, uh, yeah, and I'm in the countryside. So although I'm not in a mountain, well, not, not too far from uh, scuba, scuba sun. So, um, and so I thought I'd go for a llama and then, uh, Ibaraki Lama didn't have quite the ring to it, and I'm only, I'm not that far out of Tokyo. I'm I'm really only about less than an hour um, from Tokyo, so I thought, ah, oh, be easier to remember. It was just Tokyo Lama, so I went with that. Probably not the best name. I probably should have gone with Ibaraki Lama, but um, it sort of stuck, and no, I'm not going to change it now. <laughs> no, I like it. It's it's something that's easy to find and easy to remember. So why not? Um, I love all the videos that you've done about your remodel, but I also love this new series that you're starting to do by going and visiting other people who are also remodeling old houses around Japan. And there's so much to compare and contrast with hmm. your own experience. Are you planning to do more of that next year? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to do more of those from time to time. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've got um, another one that I filmed that I just haven't edited yet probably should do soon and I've also visited another yeah another one as well that um I is not too far from here that have just started renovation so I filmed the before and I think I'll wait for the renovation to be completed I may I may I'll see but when I have time I'll start looking at that one and then maybe do an after of that one a combined video I'm not sure but um that's, that's an great. interesting one too um, yeah well, I think there's it, every every case is, is a little bit of similarities, but also so many unique things in each house, right? Each yeah. remodel project. It's so fun that you can do that. And you can share your insights and your expertise about video making and sharing it on your YouTube um, and highlight more of these great cases. I hope more people will take up these abandoned houses and make great homes out of it like you have done. Thank you so much for yeah, sharing. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone, for all your great comments and questions today. And definitely check out Tokyo Lama on uh, YouTube and Instagram. Thanks, everyone. Happy thank New Year. Much. I think that's our last interview for this year. How exciting. Thank you so much. Okay, Happy New Year.